in introducing Tom, I want to just share a few remarks with you. You know, many of us follow the abundance of professional sports teams, uh, and we're really blessed uh, how many great teams that we have here in Colorado, even though our Broncos didn't do so good this year. Uh, we've got the Broncos, the Rockies, the Nuggets, the Avs, and uh, some others, but there's a wide variety of sports entertainment just right outside of our front door. I've noticed at times, however, that certain sports teams or players are given more recognition and opportunity simply based on their gender, their race, what outrageous thing that they might say at a given time, uh, or their financial standing. Babe Ruth once said, who is richer, the man who is seen but cannot see, or the man who is not being seen but who can see? Let that sink in for a little bit. In a world that speaks about equal opportunity but does not always seek it, it is incredibly important to practice this when recognizing athletes who are often in the forefront of today's news. I believe that the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame is doing just that, seeing individuals for their athletic skill rather than qualities that they have no control over. In fact, their mission statement reads that they, quote, exist to honor by public acknowledgement or commemoration those individuals who merit recognition and distinction for their exploits accomplishments and leadership in sports and athletic endeavors in the state of Colorado. Since they were established in 1964, the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame has grown from an annual awards dinner to a museum, website, and countless fundraisers raising support to give back to our community. In doing so, they have simultaneously encouraged youth to strengthen and cultivate their character by building and developing programs. Tom Lawrence, as president and CEO, is the personification of the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame. He has worked alongside countless sports organizations, including the USA Wrestling, the Denver Nuggets Basketball, the Denver Broncos, the Colorado Rockies, and more. During his work as president and CEO, he has led the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame into innovative growth by negotiating alliances with other foundations and sports groups, organizing the 4 and 5A Colorado High School, High School Football Championship Saturday. How many have been to that? My kids go to Valor, so we kind of go once in a while, I have to say. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, at Mile High, launching the Golf Classic and overseeing their annual induction banquet. Tom has served the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame well by taking a $250,000 deficit and turning it into a million dollar organization in 2017. Because of this involvement, the Carl Sports Hall of Fame has been able to give over $1.6 million to youth sports organizations such as Special Olympics, the National Center of Sports for the Disabled, and the Gold Crown Foundation. In addition, Tom has served on many boards that are striving to better, better the community, such as the Boys and Girls Club, the Denver Nuggets Foundation, CU's Athletic Mentor Program, and many more. Tom has a wealth of experience and knowledge, both as a businessman and philanthropist, and I am thrilled to welcome him with us tonight. Tom, come to the front, please. Thank you. Brian, thank you. I think you said it all, so good night, everybody. <laughs> uh, no, I'm blessed to be able to, to work in an industry that, you know, uh, a lot of people, there's a line out the door that would love to, to, uh, to work in professional sports. And it's, it's, it's all come about, in a sense, sometimes luck. You, know, you, get, you get lucky to get a door open, you get an opportunity, but then you've got to perform. So I'm doing something I love to do. Uh, I want to acknowledge Kate Becker, who is uh, my staff of one, <laughs> so, and Kate and I work together at the Nuggets. So again, you know, a 30-year relationship who, who's come to help, uh, help us do what we do. Uh, I want to get to a video, so, which is, is a little five-minute video on the history of sports and uh, the Sports Hall of Fame. But real quick, uh, like what Brian said, we are the only Sports Hall of Fame in the United States that donates money back to its community. And we know that, it's not, a, it's not an empty uh, promise. We're part of the International Sports Heritage Association and so every year at that conference we announce what we do and they look at us like, 
why? I mean, they, they raise money to build museums and to create museums. But one of the things that we built our growth on is that we help kids. And we give, we'll give uh, about $200,000 here next month, which is 20% of our entire budget. Uh, you know, one of my pet peeves I, I talk about, we talk about nonprofits. You know, nonprofit is strictly a marketing term. It means nothing. We're 501c3 tax exempt organizations. As long as you're meeting your mission, the IRS, foundations, anybody who's supporting you, they want you to make a profit. They want you to be solvent. And it, it's surprising that you, you don't have to spend every dollar you've got, but just keep you know, meeting your mission and keep growing. Uh, and a pet peeve I have is that a lot of nonprofits are run by program directors and not business people. I'd love to see more business people get involved in running nonprofits because I think they would be more successful. Uh, with that said, well, well let's, uh, you can think about that. Let's take a look at the video and have a little entertainment. And then uh, when you come back, we'll, uh, we'll have some, some questions where I can talk a little bit more about uh, the 54 years of the Sports Hall of Fame. Some changes were cultural. Others, far more important, would cast shadows for a long time. It was in this setting, some 40 years ago, that the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame was born. Remember, this was a time when sports didn't hold the mainstream sway it holds today. College athletics were certainly popular, but primarily with alumni. Pro sports were light years from what we see today. Professionally, Colorado had minor league baseball. And what many considered minor league football in the early <laughs> days of the AFL. Still, it was in these times that the Denver Chamber of Commerce and the right people in the right places decided that it was time for the state to recognize a rich, growing sports history and culture. The first class inducted in 1965 said a lot about the long overdue nature of this new hall. Jack Dempsey, Dutch Clark and Wizard White. Men who had established their athletic legends in the 20s and 30s. The Roaring Twenties and the ensuing depression were times made for these three. Tough and determined, they slugged and ran their way into the headlines. With this stellar first class, the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame not only was on its way, but it also had its mandate to try to live up to the standards set in 1965. In its first 10 years, the hall welcomed many who graced the state with their brilliance, skill, and accomplishment. Football and basketball stars from college and the pros. Olympic heroes as well. And perhaps the greatest female athlete ever. She won two gold medals with astonishing performance. Golf was the favorite sport of the world's greatest woman athlete. They all were called to the hall between 1965 and 1974. Between 1975 and 1984, the likes of David Thompson, 
and John Elway became part of the sporting fabric of Colorado. Those ten years saw the face of Colorado sports change. The Broncos seemed to grow larger with their long-awaited success. The love affair between the fans and the team forever changed the way Colorado would watch sports. It was in these second ten years that the Hall of Fame started to honor the Broncos prominently, from the man who kept the franchise afloat, to some of the greatest players ever to wear the orange and blue. This decade also saw many college legends recognized. From those who called the shots, to those who made those shots pay off. The third decade and the installation of more heralded and deserving contributors to Colorado sports. Including the induction of two of the most prolific scorers in the history of professional basketball. This group also brought in some of the most revered coaches and leaders in Colorado sports history. Hey, I wonder if they believe we're for real now. Huh? I guarantee you we're for real. Hey, for the Broncos, it was time to recognize some of the franchise's most memorable performers, the m and Connection. The leaders of the Orange Crush defense. Tell me the 47-year-old man 
Women who wowed the world with their Olympic accomplishments. And men whose size belied their toughness and talent. sports I mean it's just it's it's interesting I mean, if if a city doesn't have you know major league sports teams they, they lose a part of the fabric of their society you know it's corporations look for cities that have this because it's not only it's an opportunity to uh, to entertain people but it really it, it just becomes part of your life and uh, one of the things we do with the sports hall of fame I was touching on earlier is that you know supporting 30 youth sports organizations really it sports teaches the basics that you need to get through life you know one of the stories i talk about is how uh you know the when they give out ribbons and you know participation trophies and all that that ho hopefully that's starting to uh, to change because real life is not about that one of the great things about sports is it's like you uh, you want to go out for the team, be it whatever, basketball, baseball, football, whatever. And you go to the coach, you go to your parents, and, they, and you, you say, well, what do I need to do to make the team? And they can give you a game plan, and you go out and you work real hard, 
you may or may not make that team. What lessons does that teach you? Then let's say you do make the team. You don't necessarily get to play. And then, okay, you make the team and you, get, you are playing. You know, are you the star? No, maybe not. And then you're, you're, you're the star in that team, you're getting to play a lot, but you're losing all the time. It teaches you, you, you come out of that, and whatever line of work you get into, it teaches you perseverance, and you keep trying. And everybody in here is in sales of some, sport, some sort. Whether you're selling a product, or you're selling your ideas, or you're selling yourself to your coworkers, you're not always successful. You look at baseball, if you're a 300 hitter, you're in the Hall of Fame. You're hitting three out of 10 times. You know, in sales, if you're hitting one out of 10, you're doing great. But what it teaches you, you just keep, so you know, you go, you, you put together a great presentation, and you go out and you think you're gonna get the, the, uh, the job or the, uh, the contract, and you don't get it. Do you go back and do you quit? No, you go back and you figure out why didn't you get it? I've got to work a little bit harder. And sometimes things just don't work out. You can, you can give it all your best, and it, sometimes it just doesn't work out. You know, I had, uh, had a chat with uh, a friend of mine who I've known for 30 years. He's, he's been on our board, uh, an attorney in town, and he has, uh, we've had a great relationship. We've, we've argued against each other at times. Uh, when I was working indirectly with the Broncos and, and he was with the baseball team in, in town and they were coming to town and stuff, but he hasn't been in, involved on our board much lately because he's been, he was fighting leukemia and then he beat that a couple of years ago and then he had a heart attack in, in, uh, in the hospital and, and then he's gotten melanoma now and he's about you know, 72 years old, and we, and we were chatting, and he just said, you know, he says, I just got dealt, he said, you got it, it's this life. He says, I got, got dealt some low cards, and you just got to face it, you got to deal with it, and that's part of his the sports background. And we were just talking about, okay, you know, do you want to continue on the board, and you know, what, what, what can we do, what, what do you want to do? And he, he, uh, he brought up a great statement. He said he had talked to Larry Lucchino, who was one of the owners, that used to be the owners of the Padres, and now with, I believe, the, the, the Red Sox. And Larry said, you know, he said, in life, you're judged by your entrances and your exits. And you think about it, you know. And, uh, and so you know, we kind of ended our conversation that way, and I've been thinking about that all day today. So anyway, uh, if you have any... You know, Brian, do we open up for questions or? Okay. Uh, born and raised in Colorado, uh, grew up in Aurora. My uh, my mom and dad met at Fitzsimmons Medical Center. He was a pilot in World War II and was injured. They sent him there. My mom was a nurse. They decided to stay. My dad worked for the original Frontier Airlines. Uh, I went to Aurora Central. And then uh, my life changed. I was 18, I was a senior, I was headed to CU on a basketball scholarship, and my dad suddenly died of cancer. And, uh, you know, when you're a kid, of course, at that time, you're, you're, you're pretty much into yourself, and all I wanted to do was play basketball and go to, you know, couldn't wait to go to school. But, you know, I learned at that time, I better go get a job. And luckily, I've got school taken care of. And from that point on, I've been on my own. I didn't feel sorry for myself. I didn't you know, think I was entitled to anything. And, and I, was just, I was lucky enough that I had an education. So went to CU, got a degree in business, degree in commercial recreation, and graduate work at uh, UCD as well. Uh, one of the first things I did is join the Denver Athletic Club because I had heard, hey, it was a great place to play basketball. There was a lot of good players there. And it was a great networking place. And that's how I got into sports, is a gentleman there by the name of Dean Bonham was a friend of mine. He had become president of the Denver Nuggets and went over there and they were having a lot of problems. And he asked me if I knew anything about corporate sales. And I said, you know, sales is sales. You know, you learn the product and you, you work hard. So I went over there and uh, within about six months, I was vice president of corporate sales and stayed with them for about six years. Uh, during that time, and then uh, the team was sold. Sidney Schlenker owned it at that time, and 
he uh, sold it to Peter Bino and Bertram Lee, who were the first minority owners in, in all of professional sports. And then uh, uh, Sydney went off with Dean and they were building the Pyramid Arena in Memphis, Tennessee. And you may see it in the movie The Firm, it's in the background, it's a stainless steel pyramid shaped arena and that was gonna house the, uh, the NBA franchise there. So for a period of about six months, I was working for both ownership groups because I was handling all the corporate sponsorship money which was having an effect upon the sale price of the team. And uh, after that, uh, I got a call from uh, Tom O'Malley, who was a former vice chairman of Solomon Brothers, and he got called in by P. Roselle to help uh, Mr. Bolin with, uh, Mr. Bolin got into some financial difficulty building the skyboxes at Mile High Stadium. And so Tom had asked me to, they called me, asked if I'd come in and, uh, you know, fix that. So I came in, did that in the 90s. And then at the time, uh, my wife was an accountant and she got a great offer to move to San Francisco at the Millennium in January 2000 to work for uh, Thomas Weisel Partners. And the incentive to get me out there was Tom Weisel was the financier to Lance Armstrong's team, Tailwind Sports. So uh, I quit the, quit the Broncos, which were uh, tough to do <laughs> and moved to San Francisco and it was interesting to get out there and of course we get there in, in uh, January and of course the uh, the tech burst in in March and of course nobody in the Bay Area believed it for about a year that it would all come back and uh, but the interesting thing I was about ready to go to work for Tailwind Sports and the president of the of the, of the firm Mark Gorski uh, comes to me about two weeks before I'm supposed to start and said that he had quit and uh, he was heading back to Kansas City and he goes, Tom, he says, uh, and he says, I would advise you, you don't want to have anything to do with what's going on with this team. Little did I know at that time what was going on until till today. And uh, so kind of an interesting, so lasted there a couple years, uh, actually became where it ran, was the, the golf head, uh, the golf professional at the Presidio out there, because I play a lot of competitive golf as well. But eventually I moved back to uh, Denver. Uh, Charlie Gallagher was a former client of mine and he and a partner had a company they needed help with. So I came back to Denver. And as you can see, it kind of a pattern. I get called to fix things. I'm, I'm kind of a revenue generator. And so I come back and uh, I'm doing that and I'm out with, when, uh, I'm having lunch with a mentor of mine, uh, Bill Fletcher, who re uh, ran the Rocky Mountain News. So, uh, with him and he was meeting with Vern Malinen who was on the board of the Hall of Fame and the next day they called me and that's when they told me that they had gotten themselves a quarter million in debt on basically about a hundred thousand dollar budget and they were they were in trouble maybe having to shut this thing down and so uh, went over there and 15 years later we're you know we've built a, a reserve of about 1.1 million and we've donated 1.6 million to uh, roughly about 30 different youth sports organizations throughout Colorado. Uh, and we do not get any money from foundations, from the state, from the city. We are all totally self-funded. We put on the Hall of Fame banquet, which there, uh, there's invitations here uh, that comes in April. Uh, the Hall of Fame banquet, we put on a golf tournament at the Broadmoor in August. And then we put on the high school championship games at the stadium that the Broncos came to me and said they'd wanted to do. And, and Chaza, the High School Activity Association, didn't want to take that on because they had no incentive to make any more money. They're, they're kind of a pseudo a government agency. And so we donate $65,000 a year to Chaza, which goes out to all the high schools in the state by their charter. And we put on those games and we take, take the risk uh, to do it and, and uh, put that on. From those three events, we take the profits of those, which roughly amount to about $200,000, and donate that back out to those organizations. The Broncos allow us to uh, put on tours of Sports Authority Field, and that's our operating income. We, uh, our overhead is about 15%, which, which is pretty good for a, a 501c3. Our annual budget's a little, little over a million dollars. So we're giving 20% of our budget annually out to the community, and that is 10 times what a lot of foundations do. Uh, so we, we act like a foundation, but we're not. And uh, so it's, uh, 
you know, something I thought I'd be doing for a couple of years and 15 years later, I, I'm, I'm still doing it. It, uh, it uh, like I said earlier, I'm, I feel lucky that I can do it. And then the, the people I've met over the years uh, and the athletes and, you know, and 90% of the athletes are terrific people. They, they really, and they, you learn from them. I mean, you can see, they have that look in their eye. You can see how they got to where they are because they are so focused on, uh, on uh, where they want to go. So uh, this, this year's banquet is going to be a special one. Peyton Manning is being inducted. Uh, we're almost sold out. We get, we will get 900 people there. And I think the last count, Kay was telling me, I think we're at about 750 right now. And we're, we're three months away from it already. Our golf tournament is sold out at the, at the Broadmoor. Uh, it's, it's one of the most popular tournaments, 5,500 to foursome and we sell, 30 and we're sold out six months in advance because we give back. One of the things I had talked about earlier about nonprofits or 501c3s being run by, you know, non-business people, you, you can't just always have your hand out. You've got to give something back to the folks who are supporting you and run it like a business and run it to make a profit and you know, Give, you know, put together sponsorship packages. Have, have that inventory that you can, you can do, you can help somebody. So you can go to a corporation and, you know, they give you, the, give you money for your organization, but also you, you can take them to the banquet and you, you can take them to the golf tournament and the football games and stuff. And it's so I've kind of put the, the package together very much like when I was working for, uh, for the sports teams. So, uh you know, say we just hope we just we keep growing it. Uh, the other thing we do is we just we run real lean. It's Kate and I, you know, running it. We don't have I'm, you know, we between the two of us we CEO, COO, CFO, CMO, you know, uh, development director. We put on the events ourselves. We don't hire event coordinators. You know, everything is just really really tight to the vest. And then we have 35 board members who are fundraisers. They all have a five thousand dollar give or get. So their job is to get out there and sell a couple of tables or a foursome. And, uh, and as I tell them, I said, I don't, I don't need your expertise on how to run the thing or to put on events. I need your expertise. Just go out and sell a couple of tables. And if you're on, a, you're, a, you're on a nonprofit board and you can't sell a couple of tables to a banquet, you shouldn't be on that board. You, know, you have no, no context. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I guess that's, uh, that's kind of that's it all. Uh, should I tell the little story about, uh, about Dick Clark? I've heard some of your stories. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> well, this was, a, this, this was an interesting story just about the people that I've met over, over the years. But during the sale of the Nuggets, I was working for the two different ownership groups. I get a call. I was in Denver, and Sydney and Dean had already—they're already in Memphis building the pyramid, and they're working with a gentleman by the name of John Tigret. John Tigret is very famous. Get the book called Hammer about Arm and Hammer. He was a—he was a deal maker for Arm and Hammer and J. Paul Getty, and he was a mentor to Sir James Goldsmith, the corporate raider. So he was a partner with us. So you're—you're you're, you're running with you know, pretty tough characters and. He was the guy who cut the deal with Muammar Gaddafi to give Occidental Petroleum over and, you know, and, and uh, so anyway, so I get a call that Sydney says, oh, I need you to come to Memphis and then you got to get an end to New York and then to L.A. in a span of about two and a half days. So I fly to Memphis, meet with them. We go out to dinner that night. The next morning, Dean and I, we fly to New York, meet with some corporate sponsors. The next morning, we fly straight to L.A. And the reason we were going to L.A., is that Sydney had, according to Sydney, had cut a deal with Dick Clark. And if you remember Dick Clark from New Year's Eve, American Bandstand, everything. So here's a guy I'm going to picture him to go meet because I grew up watching this guy on Saturday mornings uh, as a kid. And anyway, Sydney had cut a deal with Dick Clark to move the American Music Awards to Memphis to be how to be done in the pyramid. So Dean and I get there, and one of the first things, so now, you know, you're, I'm on a, I leave, I am go to Denver, to Memphis, Memphis to New York, New York to L.A. in two days, and you're kind of blurry just from that. We get to L.A., and the only car they have for us is a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> and so I'm telling you, I said, they're going to really be impressed when we pull up in front of his office. So we pull up in, in his office, we go in, 
and we're sitting in this conference room, and you couldn't believe it. The memorabilia, the, the music memorabilia would just blew your mind. I mean, stuff from the Beatles and, and uh, just, you know, and, and Elvis and stuff, unbelievable. And so and I'm, I'm sitting at this conference table, I'm right here, an empty seat next to me, and Dean's here, and their CEO is right here. Dick Clark walks in. And at that time, he had to be in his 70s, and he looked like he was 40. Just, he was a very handsome man. He comes over, he sits down next to me, and so he, uh, he's sitting there, and he goes and introduces himself. What do you guys do a lot? And, then he, and he stands up, and he goes over, and he starts to move this picture. And he goes, he says, I just want to know who in the F <laughs> put it out that we're moving the music, American Music Awards <laughs> to Memphis. Well, in the two and a half days, Sydney had sent out a press release announcing it. So a little business move, you get it out into the public and now you can't take it back. The deal's gotta get done. So I'm watching this childhood idol of mine up there dropping F-bombs left and right. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, how can we get out of here as soon as possible? And he comes back down, he sits down and he goes, okay, I got that off my chest, how do we make this work? I went, okay. <laughs> So another little lesson learned, you know, you don't take it all. So, and then we, we talked about it. We get in, a, get in our Ford Fiesta to drive back to LA airport and fly back to Denver. So we went from Denver to Memphis, New York, LA to Denver in like two days. And it was like going, holy cow. I remember I get home, walk in and see my wife. I go, I'm going straight to bed. I don't want to talk. It's over. So, <laughs> but fun. So, <clears throat> thank you. Okay, I'll ask three questions and we'll open up to the group. Um, what is your most memorable induction into the Hall of Fame and why? Boy, uh, you know, one that really comes to mind is uh, when Pat Bolin was inducted several years ago that he came to tears to show the emotion and how much it meant to him. And, it, you know, I was lucky enough that I got to, when I worked for the, for the Broncos, I got to spend some time with, with Pat and Annabelle, and uh, he truly, as, a, as an owner, there was nothing short of doing everything the best and trying to win. And so to get inducted, it was like he was being acknowledged for, for what he did, and that was very special. Uh, one other one that kind of comes to mind, too, is one of the awards, we not only at our bank, we, not only do we induct anywhere from four to six people, but we also give out awards to the athletes of the year, to the prior year, so the male and female high school and college and the pros. And one of the awards that probably I'm most proud of is I started the Disabled Athlete Recognition Award. And every year we give an award to someone from Special Olympics or the National Sports Center for the Disabled. And that year this young lady from Special Olympics gets up and she had Down syndrome but in her 20s, and she proceeds to talk about how she was told as a child that she, couldn't, she was going to be institutionalized. She would never be able to work. She could never do anything. And she proceeds to start talking about how many gold medals she's won, silver medals, bronze medals, and how she's working in a Special Olympics office. Not a dry eye in the house. People just, and then right after her, Joe Sackick was being inducted. And Joe gets up, and the first thing he says is, and I forget, he says, he looks over to her and he goes, I've done nothing in my career compared to what she did. Wow. Yeah. wow. That's powerful. Um, which sport do you believe has the most growth potential in Colorado? The one that's shown the most gross, gross, growth is uh, lacrosse. Uh, you know, not only in the country, but in, I believe Colorado is the fastest growing state for lacrosse. And a lot of that has to do... Uh, a few years ago when uh, DU hired uh, Coach Tierney from, uh, from uh, Princeton. And, uh, and a lot of that was, was facilitated by Mac Freeman from the Denver Broncos who played lacrosse in college. And he convinced uh, Coach Tierney to come out to take the DU job. So uh, lacrosse, great growing sport. And it's a great alternative to football, sadly for football. But it's, you know, you give, you know, you give a boy or a girl a stick and a ball, and I mean, they're going to have fun. So. Um, what change would you like to see in sports? Less money. <laughs> it's, 
you know, it, it's it's sad to see how you know, you know the, the the amount of money the professional athletes make, and I don't and I can't begrudge them. I mean, everybody should be able to. If somebody's there is willing to pay you, you don't turn it down. But the problem is that it is filtered all the way down to high school and now into junior high and even into grade school. And what ends up happening is you get a lot of the helicopter parents who now think their kid is the next Peyton Manning. And you see the problems that it's, it's creating in high school sports. You see it in, you see it in the state now where there's, there's, I believe there's seven high school football jobs available because the coaches have quit. And I know in a lot of those cases where they've just kind of gotten fed up you know, with with dealing with this, and you know, not 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 everybody's going to be successful, but it's it's taken a lot of fun away, and also at the high school level, the kids can't they can't go out and have fun, and they're they're pushed to specialize in one sport to get that scholarship because not only the professional dollars, but then you know what it costs to go to college nowadays. You know, when I was at CU, you could go to CU for. Five thousand dollars a year or less. I mean, it's probably less than that. I mean, it's a major commitment to spend thirty, forty thousand dollars a year to go to college when not everybody really should be going to college. But you can see where everybody gets so competitive for, in sports to try to get that scholarship that they start doing anything, you know. And at the, and that's where a lot of the problems start because at the high school level, you get the things with. Uh, drugs that enhance, you know, your steroids, your HGH, all that, because high schools don't have enough money to test for it. And that's why you're, you know, you go out and you see some of these high school football games and you're seeing kids out there that are 6'5", 300 pounds. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. And it's sad. And so I, that's, that's the part. It's become, it's become so money driven that I'm afraid a lot of kids are, aren't playing sports just to have fun. And, and enjoy, you know, each other and the the, uh, the team teamwork. I'm going to try to use this. That dance was fun that you and I were doing, but I thought maybe Does this work or not. There we go. Um, let's open up to the crowd. What questions do we have? Yes. So let me just repeat it right quick because we've got to get it on the video. So her question is, uh, given all the members and inductees and everything that are involved in the organization, do you see women playing a more prominent role in the organization? Absolutely. No, we are, I, I think anybody who has a board, anybody with a company in here, one of the first things you're always trying to do is get more diversity on your board. Not only women, but minorities and we actually, we have a larger percentage of women on our, on our board than most boards do. I believe right now we have about seven, uh, eight women on our board. Now our selection committee is a separate committee. I don't vote, our board doesn't vote. We have a, the selection committee is made up of 30 people from print and electronic media. And they also are always trying, you know, to get as much diversity as they can on that board, but absolutely. You know, and I think the other thing is you, you would, you'd see is that just really in the, in the past 20 years since Title IX have there been a lot more female athletes. So females didn't play sports back in the 20s, 30s, and all that. And so it's catching up. But absolutely, we're always, always trying to do that. Yes. Yes, Betty. So the question is, she remembers the days when teams had loyalty, where the players would actually stay with the team, even though they were offered uh, other compelling packages. Do you think that'll ever come back? No. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> no, that's, you know, exactly. It's, you know, you can't blame the players, you know, and that all started with free agency. Because uh, up until that time, they probably weren't compensated enough, and they were, they were, servants of the teams 
And you know, you can't blame a lot of these guys, especially in football, where the average the average career in, in the NFL is less than three years. You know, they're 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 one injury away from having to start over. So you you got to get as much as you can when you can. So yeah, I, I don't I don't see that ever happening, unfortunately. Okay, next question. Yes. So the first question is, are all the Colorado sports included in the vote? And then another one? What's your other question? The other one is, has the barrel guy been inducted? <laughs> and the last one is, has the barrel guy been inducted? I'll answer the second one first. No, he hasn't. <laughs> uh, no, all sports are included. And that's one thing the selection committee, uh, Probably with some of my encouragement, they really need to start looking at some other things. Uh, you know, lacrosse is, is growing. I mean, there's, I think, John Grant, who has played here a long time, is probably a gentleman who, you know, was probably the greatest lacrosse player in this country who ended up playing a lot of his career here. You know, I think he'll be nominated at some point. To go in the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame, there's two criteria. If you were born in Colorado, you're an automatic. So if you were born here, like Kate, Kate could nominate me. I wouldn't get in, but <laughs> so, uh, or you lived in Colorado while you performed your particular sport, uh, whether you played for the team. So you take a, like a Byron Wizard White was born and raised here. You know, as a side note, talk about what sports can do for you. Goes on to become Supreme Court Justice of the United States. Uh, and then you get John Elway, who was born in Idaho, grew up in California, and then, but played in Colorado. So that's how he got in. Uh, but we need to look, our selection committee needs to look at, you know, all of the winter sports, you know, the extreme skiing and, and snowboards and all that and to get caught up because it's, yeah. there's a joke that uh, I, I, I got from Jim Sacamano. If you don't know, Jim Sacamano was a longtime PR guy for the Denver Broncos forever and he's retired now. He's, uh, he's currently on our board. But he talked about, he told me one time, he said, you know, it's far easier to become a Catholic saint than it is to go into a sports hall of fame. <laughs> because there are, I don't know how many, I think there's like 10,000 Catholic saints. And we have 254 people in the Colorado Sports Hall of Fame. So it, it's, it's extremely difficult. Let's take one or two more questions. Anyone? One once? Oh, right there. So the question is, in this culture of living uh, that we're in, that uh, everybody gets a trophy, whether you win or lose, are you uh, at all able to be this voice of reason uh, to some of these parents and children? You know, if, if I'm ever asked by an organization my thoughts on that, I absolutely I give them my, my opinion on it. Uh, you know, and there's some, I, I, well, one of the organizations, that the, the Denver Police Activities League, which is run by Jake Schroeder, and I mean, I'm sure you've all seen Jake sing National Anthem at, all of the Avs games, you know, and he, he was the lead singer for Opie Gone Bad. And Jake's been a great friend. He comes to our banquet and sings the national anthem. But he runs that, and we've talked about it, and it's, he's gotten rid of that. Uh, you, know, I, you know, and I, I have a, my son's 28 years old, and was a, he, he's successful, works for Oracle now, but was a terrific athlete, 
but I enabled him. I mean, I pushed, it was like, you could do everything, I did it for him, and I, and I look back, I could have done things differently. You know, when I was brought up in, in old Aurora, you know, we wandered everywhere, and you competed against anybody and everybody from Denver. I remember being out at Del Mar Park playing basketball to all hours of the night, coming home, and you know, have blood all over me from either, you know, just playing ball, accidentally getting hit, or, or maybe not accidentally, and trying to explain that to my mom and dad, and then taking me to get stitched up and stuff. But you, you, you learn that failure is okay. The key is just get out there and just keep fighting, keep trying it. You know, don't be afraid to make that decision or, or take that jump, and you're gonna fail, but you're gonna learn from that. And I, and I think we've taken some of that away from our kids, that we've, we do too much for them so they succeed because we want them to have better than what we had. Uh, I think in a lot of cases too, a lot of parents kind of live vicariously through their, their children who get successful in sports and, and that's dangerous as well. Uh, it, it's your high school, a little of that was going on that I'm not gonna go into about a couple of, of a feud between a couple of families there, but uh, you know, I, if, if, if I'm at, we, what we try to do, one of the things I'm kind of getting off that, but one of our board members, Theo Gregory, who was with the El Pomar Foundation, and I've known Theo for years because he was an assistant athletic director at CU. But when we started building this money up, and when I said, look, we've got to do more than dishonor these athletes. We've got to reach out and help kids somehow. So it was discussed, so well, should we do scholarships? Should we put on camps? Should we do this stuff? And he brought up one, one great notion was that, that in coming from El Pomar was he said, don't do what other nonprofits are already doing. Support those nonprofits so they can do a better job at what they're doing. And so we have done that. We, we look out and we see what fits our mission to help you sports. And so we fund them and, and, and we're, we're asked to give advice on how they can be better. Uh, and so with that, if you know, someone says, you know, we're gonna do ribbons or, or trophies, and I've been to some of these events and I see that and then I'll kind of pull somebody aside and go, I said, you know, I, I can't support everybody, you know, getting a trophy. Now, it's a balancing act. You, you, want every, you want inclusion, you want everybody to have an opportunity, but in the end, are you really hurting these kids? Because when they get out in the real world, they get devastated when they, when they don't get that trophy or they don't get that job and they don't, you know, get the raise or whatever, and they don't get that Audi when they're 22 years old, and you know, and they wanna go from A to Z overnight. You know, and I see it, I, we, we'll get, Kate and I will bring in four interns every summer. And you know, a lot of them, they'll come in and say, you know, God, I want Tom's job, and I'm going, you don't know how many years and how much blood and sweat and, and pneumonia and all these things to get to this point, you know? So it's, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Let's give Tom a round of applause. Okay, for those who have been here before, you know I like to share the 10 golden nuggets of wisdom as I see it. If you disagree with them, that's okay. They're my 10 golden nuggets that I get from the speaker. Uh, number one, I would love to see more business people run nonprofits as they would be more successful. Number two, sports teaches some of the basics you need to get through life. How many in the room have ever played sports before? Pretty much all of us, right? I'm not going to ask the question who hasn't played sports. I'm just not going to do it. But it is interesting what it teaches you. Number three, sports teaches you perseverance. And I agree with that 100%. Number four, everyone is in sales, whether you are selling a product, yourself, or an idea. Number five, in life, you are judged by your entrances and your exits. Number six, I get called to fix things. I'm a revenue generator. How many of you might be able to be in some sphere where you're called to fix things? Because if you are, you're going to be in demand. There's always something broken, right, in the world. Number seven, we give 20% of our revenue away to the community. Yesterday, I got an opportunity to tour the corporate headquarters of Hobby Lobby in Oklahoma City. I flew in and out the same day. And they started with $600, $450 loan uh, for their equipment, $150 for working capital. 
This year, they're going to do over $4.5 billion. And I got to tour the facility. It's just amazing. 10.5 million square feet. And they try to give over 50% of their re net revenues away to charitable causes. That's powerful. Very powerful. And I encourage each of us to think about what does that look like in your own companies or what you can give. Each one of us can give of our time, our talent, of our treasure. You can give something. Number eight. 90% of athletes are terrific people. They have that look in the eye. And we all know what that look in the eye means, right? Somebody who's hungry, somebody who wants to go do something and create something positive. Number nine, you can't just always ask people for a handout. You have to give back. How many times are you doing too much asking and not enough giving in your own life? And I had a number 10, but I'm going to change it now and do a different number 10. And it's about failure. And this idea that failure is okay. In fact, I would submit that the only true failure in the world is not to at least try. And so I encourage all of you to try.